In this video we're going to create our first app and so let's start by opening Android Studio and choosing start a new Android Studio project. From here you can give this a name. I'm just going to go with the default. Then you have your company domain. This would typically be your business uh, website or if you have a personal website, whatever you're going to identify. And the reason you use a company domain or something that you own is that as you develop apps on, for Android, they have to be unique values. So notice here the package name says com.example.brent.myapplication. This is often referred to as a reverse domain where you take your website and then you reverse it and that becomes a unique identifier because presumably your website is unique. Then you can also change the project location if you'd like. Go ahead and choose next. Now here you can select what devices you're going to build for. And in this series, we're going to be talking about phone and tablet devices. You also have the choice to select what we call the target API, which refers to a specific Android operating system. Now, if I go here and I select, you'll notice that you can select the latest versions uh, all the way back to, they recommend, for example, if you did uh, API 15, notice how it says your app will run on approximately 100% of devices. What they're saying is based on the devices that connect to Google Play, where everyone gets their Android apps, they are saying that everybody that's connecting in the past three, four months have been using API 15 or later. So if you targeted API 15, you would support all the devices. Now, there are some reasons why you would target newer devices. Mostly it has to do with app compatibility, which means you have new features that you want to implement, but they're not available on older operating systems. I personally prefer starting with about KitKat 4.4, which is API 19, and that gets me 90% of devices. Now, that is a lot of devices, so you typically don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and select API 19 and then choose Next. Here, we're just going to select Empty Activity and then choose Next. Finally, it asks for an activity name and this represents this particular screen. The convention is to say the title and then activity at, on the end. So if you had additional screens, for example, if it was a login screen, you could say login activity. When you say generate layout file, we want to do that because the layout file represents the visual elements on the screen. By convention, it's usually activity underscore main or the reverse of whatever the title is. So here it's doing it for us. And we definitely want to select backwards compatibility. What this does is allows you to build apps using the latest features of an SDK, for example, the material design and other things, and it allows it to work on older devices. So you want to keep that selected. Go ahead and choose Finish. Now, if this is the first time you're running Android Studio, it may take a lot longer to download and install all the SDK and dependencies. Now, check this out. So it opens up into the main editor window. And first thing we see in this instance, we've got a problem. Gradle, which is the build and compile system that creates the app for you that generates the APK file that it goes into your device. This Gradle thing is saying, hey, there's an error. This will happen a lot, especially if you change uh, target SDKs or if you have a new installation on your computer. So to fix that, they typically will give you a link. And so go ahead and select that link and it will automatically download the missing files. Again, depending on whether you're doing this for the first time or not, it can take a long time to download. Some of these files are fairly large. Then once that's complete, you go ahead and choose Finish. What happens now is every time you open your project, 
the Gradle script is going to run and try to compile the app. And if there are any errors, then it will alert you. And you always want to make sure that the app is compiling properly in order to be able to debug and to run the app. If you don't compile the app properly when you start to code, all the code hinting and other things will break and it won't be very effective. So every time you open your project or every time you finish for the day, you want to make sure that your project is compiling properly. All right, so it goes through its process and you can take a look at what's happening by seeing what we call there's the event log, which kind of gives you an overview of all the things that are happening and, and as they've completed. There's also the Gradle console, which is more of a log file that gives you all the details. And so if there was an error, for example, and the build failed, you can go to the Gradle console and you can see where it might have broken or stopped. Again, the event log will kind of track the overall things that happen throughout the day. All right. Next, we can also close this out by closing down the event log. So for what we're looking at, it automatically opens the main activity.java file. And this represents the source code behind the visual elements of an app. If you twirl open here and you go through the folders, there's a number of files and, and objects that we'll get to and, and discuss as we go. But I want to call your attention to this main activity.java file. This is going to be located in Java and under your, notice the package name, which is what we started with. And now we have this main activity. Then if you go down here, there's what we call the res file, which deals with all of the visual elements. And you go to layout, you twirl that open and you see activity main. All right, let's select activity main. And here you're going to see some markup language in XML that define what we call the visual elements. And right now, in an empty activity, it's got this text view already set up for us. And it says, hello world. Now let's go ahead and run this app and see it in action. Up here at the top, you'll see the selector that you can choose. And by default, it's going to create what we call the app, which is your main project. You can go ahead and choose run. And at this point, if you have a device connected, first of all, it's going to see based on what device is connected and if you have turned on USB debugging. So I'm going to show you now how to turn on and set up your device for debugging. Here I am on my device and I'm in the settings app. I'm going to scroll down to see where it says about. Then I select that. From here, I'm going to select software information. Then you're going to tap seven times on build number. I've already done this, but if you do that, it'll indicate that you've turned on developer options. Back out and you'll now see developer options. Then you want to scroll down and select USB debugging. Go ahead and turn that on and select OK. And now your device is ready for debugging. OK, once your device is ready, in this case, my device is currently locked. And it's prompting me to allow US debugging. And it says, the computer's RSA key fingerprint is, and it gives me a, a, a long hex number. And what this is, is asking for permission. Because if you connect your device to your computer, you need to authorize your computer to connect to your device. And so there's a check that says always allow from this computer. So select that and then choose OK. Once you do that, notice that the device is now available and connected. All right, so you can see that it will identify what devices are connected. You can select that and then you can click OK. Now, this is going to refer to instant run. Instant run is a process that allows you to build and then run the app again without having to recompile everything. Now, it, you have to have a device that can support it. 
mine happens to be one that can support it and you can go ahead and click install and continue for our purposes i'm not going to do that because i want you to get into a habit of understanding the build process and how it all works but instant run is a great feature if you're doing a lot of development and you want to see it on the device without having to rebuild the entire app every time so for now i'm going to choose proceed without instant run then you can take a look on your device and you can see it in action. Okay, once you have the app running on your device, you'll notice up here that it has a stop button. Go ahead and stop that in order to cancel the process. Right now you're connected to your device and we want to stop that whenever we make changes. If you don't have a physical device connected, you can set up an emulator to run on your computer. To do that, you can first, if you select run app, instead of if you had no connected devices, that would be empty. Now, this happens to reference because I had installed Visual Studio on this computer before, it's referencing some of these other things that are built from Visual Studio to make things easier. We're going to ignore those. What I want to do is create a new virtual device. Now, here you have the opportunity to select based on a phone, tablet, all sorts of things, and you can select from a variety of devices. Most of these will be, you know, obviously the Google device ones. If you will have a Samsung device or you have some other uh, hardware, you can find profiles for these where it will represent the device that you have or the device that you're trying to target. For our purposes, I'm just going to select the default and it happens to be the Nexus 5X. Go ahead and choose Next. Now, at this point, you have to decide what operating system you're going to run. Now, you have Oreo, which is the latest operating system. You have Nougat, uh, you have 7.0 and 7.11. For my purposes, I'm going to download 7.0 which matches the device that I happen to have and the reason I do this on an emulator is that sometimes it's faster to run the emulator to quickly go back and forth and so there's a lot of reasons to do either the emulator or a device honestly you want to have a device and you should have a device to develop with but at times the emulator does enough what we need so in this case we'll go ahead and choose download and this downloads the system image, which is a special uh, representation of this operating system. And again, this can take some time. So we'll, through the magic of television, skip ahead. Again, because these images can be quite large, it may take some time. Keep in mind that you can create as many images and emulators as you want, but it will take up a lot of space. We're talking about a gigabyte of space for each emulator. So keep that in mind. If you have a lot of space on your computer, great. If not, you only need one or two emulators. Let's go ahead and choose finish. Now this has been set up and at the moment, this is all we need to do. And we'll go ahead and choose next. There's a few settings you can change. You can have what we call some default startup where we have the portrait or landscape. Uh, this is the name of the image that we've created and the device frame shows you, uh, basically it looks like the phone itself. There are some things you can do with advanced settings, but we'll, we don't need to worry about that. Go ahead and choose finish. All right, now notice in your deployment target options, you now have the Nexus emulator. So go ahead and select that and choose OK. And the same thing here, this will allow you to do instant run, which is something that you can use if you'd like. For, for now, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to proceed without it. And it's going to launch. The emulator launches on the device and it represents the visual. It looks like the Nexus 5X. The first time you run this, it may take a little while to load up. Emulators are a little slow when it comes to starting up. 
when you run it for the first time now here we have the app running which is awesome and so there's our little hello world and notice it looks similar to what we see over here in the editor all right very good so let's go ahead and stop that i'm just going to click over and stop the process from running and let's go back to the editor the emulator and notice that it's got this kind of hey welcome it's it's treating it as if you have just opened the phone for the first time all right you can keep the emulator running and as you work with your code you just go back and forth okay so that's the first half of this lesson be sure to subscribe and look for the next video where we're going to update our UI and work with the editor